There being no further introductions, it is now time for question period. The Leader of Her Majesty's Royal Opposition. Mr. Speaker, my question is for the Premier. Mr. Speaker, the Liberals just won't stop. The, cre the Premier claims she's interested in cleaning up the fundraising mess she created. Yet last week we learned that Apotex used a by-election loophole to donate nearly $10,000 to the Liberals. Wow. And what does the Premier do? She pops by for a visit at Apotex. You know, I wouldn't be alarmed by a few small donations. But this is the same company that donated nearly $200,000 to the Liberal Party. So, Mr. Speaker, can the Premier guarantee this House that by taking Apotex money that has never affected a government policy decision? Which Mr. Speaker, uh, you know, I am very much looking forward to a constructive meeting with the uh, leaders of the opposition this afternoon. I, uh, I'm not going to presuppose what will take place at that meeting, Mr. Speaker. But you know, this this whole discussion about the uh, the fundraising rules is uh, is one that we need to have, Mr. Speaker. I said last June that it's something that uh, needed to happen. I look forward to building on changes that we have already made, and I, I look forward to input from the leaders of the opposition on legislation that we will bring forward in the spring. I think there's a broad consensus that uh, we need to uh, make a transition away from corporate and union donations, Mr. Speaker, and uh, I look forward to the input from the leaders of, of the opposition on what that transition might look like. Thank you. Supplementary. Mr. Speaker, again, to the Premier and my question on Apotex has not been answered. It's one thing to receive a small donation, but the Liberals received nearly $200,000 from this one company. What, what, what does this get this company? How about $650,000 a year in drug purchases from the Ministry of Health? Does this not merit a public inquiry? I don't understand why the government is running from the public inquiry if they had nothing to hide. So I'll ask again to the Premier, has this almost 200 k that the Liberal Party has taken affected a government policy decision related to Apotex? Please answer the question, yes or no. No, it has not, Mr. Speaker. And in fact, my government, public, political donations do not buy policy decisions in my government, Mr. That's Speaker. Right. And the innuendo, the innuendo that... The uh, member from... Uh, excuse me. The member from Holland and Norfolk will withdraw. Premier. Any innuendo or suggestion to the uh, to the uh, opposite, Mr. Speaker, is false. That is that is the fact. So um, I've been always been very clear that the decisions that we make in my caucus and in my cabinet are made based on evidence. They're based on the best interests of the people of Ontario, to the best of our ability, Mr. Speaker. And I would say to the member opposite again, I'm looking forward to our discussion this afternoon. Thank you. I look forward to their input. Thank you. Final supplementary. Mr. Speaker, again to the Premier, if this is all smoke and it's not fire, then the Premier would embrace a public inquiry. Mr. Speaker, there are plenty of drug companies that receive money from the Liberal government. So what else may Apotex benefit from? Well, in 2011, the government, led by then Health Minister Matthews, appealed a court ruling that would allow pharmacies to have their own private labels. This would have allowed pharmacies to sell their own drugs for the same price, but not the drugs mandated by the province, like Apotex. At the time, the Globe and Mail called the decision to appeal the ruling a minor mystery. They went on to suggest that perhaps the Liberals are looking out for Apotex, the largest domestic manufacturer. Mr. Speaker, again to the Premier. Can the Premier Question. assure us that these donations are not affecting the government's decisions, and will she embrace the public inquiry to show she has confidence in the manner they have led this government? Thank you. Premier. Government House Leader. Deputy House Leader. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. It's interesting, to see, it's interesting to see the newfound interest that the member apparently has in fundraising, because I have here a list of his uh,
donations during the leadership campaign. They're absolutely astounding. He broke an all-time record. He said, first of all, Mr. Speaker, that as uh, soon as he got here, he was interested in fundraising. Order. Thank you. The member from Renfrew Nipissing Pembroke come to order. The uh, member from Nipissing Pembroke is now second time. Now I'm going to ask the member to leave his list on his desk. Yes, sir. I'll be. I'll read it from here, Mr. Speaker. An all-time record in fundraising for a leadership candidate was what was achieved by the leader of the official opposition, who said when he got here he was astounded by the fundraising rules, and yet he took advantage yes, of those fundraising rules to raise well over $1.6 million for his leadership campaign. Thank you. Time is up. New question. Leader of the Opposition. Mr. Speaker, no, my question is for he's the a, Premier. While this government has been busy attending secret $6,000 fundraising dinners, I've been touring hospitals and meeting with frontline workers across this province. Just this past weekend, I was in Windsor. I was told firsthand. <clears throat> I expect. Um, I expect some civility here, and that uh, I'll get it, one way or another. Finish, please. Mr. Speaker, I was told firsthand the impact of this government's mismanagement on health care in Windsor. 120 nurses are gone because of this government, and $20 million cut to the Windsor Regional because of this government. The budget promised one thing, but what we're seeing in reality is very, very different. I can tell you, Mr. Speaker, I didn't charge a single red cent to meet with nurses in Windsor. I wanted to hear their concerns. I wanted to hear their stories. So my question for the Premier. Mr. Speaker, Question. will the Premier meet with the nurses in Windsor without charging them $6,000 a plate? Thank you. Premier. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Well, I, uh, I think that uh, the Leader of the Opposition is fully aware that I meet with people all over the member the from Lanark, come to order. Mr. Speaker, from every sector. And we're committed on, uh, on health care to making sure that people in Ontario have the right care, Mr. Speaker, that they have it in a timely way, and that they have it in the right place. And to that end, Mr. Speaker, uh, funding for, uh, well, uh, for Windsor hospitals has increased by $124 million. That's a 47 per cent increase during our tenure. In fact, just this fiscal year, $7 million was provided to help Windsor Regional Hospital with budget pressures and to help the transition process from a registered nurse to a registered practical nurse model, Mr. Speaker. And that is work that is going on in other parts of the province. And the focus of those funds was to ensure that uh, a reduction of FTEs occurred through attrition and retirement and not through layoffs, Mr. Speaker. So it's a different model. There is a transition. Answer. There is overall in health care a transition going on, Mr. Speaker, and we are working with uh, with the health care sector in every community Thank across you. the province, Mr. Speaker. Supplementary. Mr. Speaker, back to the Premier. Those are talking points to justify a $20 million cut to the Windsor Regional Hospital. But I can tell you it's not just Chief Windsor. Government Last month, order. St. Joseph's Health Centre in London was forced to cut 49 full-time positions and 12 tra transitional care beds. Just last month, Life Labs announced they are closing 15 patient service centres. The CEO of Life Labs said Minister they had to close the Culture Sport. because the demand for testing had increased, but funding had not. Patients will struggle to get the testing they need done. The government has has created the situation, forcing communities to close clinics, doctors' offices, they have fired nurses and frontline health care workers. So my question, Mr. Speaker, is now that the Premier has demanded the Minister of Health not have private, high-level fundraising dinners, question. will he now have the time to support physicians, nurses, and stop closing labs? Thank you. Well, Mr. Speaker, once again, let me just reinforce that uh, the way we make 
policy decisions on this side of the House has nothing to do with political donations, even though the innuendo, the innuendo on the, uh, the other side of the House uh, would, suggest that, would suggest that, Mr. Speaker. It's simply false. Finish, please. What the Leader of the Opposition does not talk about is the rehiring of nurses, Mr. Speaker. He doesn't talk about what's happening in one part of the, uh, the sector. We've increased the percentage of nurses working full-time by 13.9 per cent in our term of government, Mr. Speaker, since 2003. There are now 26,300 more nurses working in nursing in Ontario since we took office, Mr. Speaker. There has been a massive influx of nurses into the system, Mr. Speaker, and we are working Answer. with communities around the province to make sure that services are delivered. Final supplementary. Mr. Speaker, back to the Premier once again. If the Premier wasn't petrified of a public inquiry, she would welcome this sunshine, this spotlight on this topic. Absolutely. We all know doctors have been without a contract for two years. During that time, Liberals have unilaterally, unilaterally cut $815 million from physicians. Further, the Minister of Health won't even meet with physicians. So, Mr. Speaker, my question is, is it because the doctors didn't ante up to the Liberal oh. fundraising calls? Mr. Speaker, how many $6,000 dinners will it take for the Premier and the Minister of Health to actually meet with our physicians in the province of Ontario? Thank you. Premier. Mr. Speaker, the Minister of Health is very much engaged with the OMA. We would like to very much have an opportunity to sit down at the table and to work out a uh, work out a, an arrangement with them, Mr. Speaker. You know, uh, the leader of the opposition may not remember, but this is the uh, the highest paid group of physicians in the country. Yes. They they earn their uh, they earn their money in, in uh, they they have every right to earn uh, earn a good wage, Mr. Speaker. But the reality is that we need that opportunity to Remember sit down with them. We're open to that. We want to work this out, Mr. Speaker, and the Minister of Health is engaged with them on a regular basis to try to get that opportunity yes. to have the conversation yes. with them. Thank you. Your question, the leader of the third party. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the Premier. Uh, New Democrats fully support the elimination of corporate and union donations, but we know there are a number of other issues uh, that need to be resolved. So later today, I'm going to be proposing to the Premier, uh, the Leader of the Opposition as well, that this Legislature initiate a transparent, independent and nonpartisan process to make recommendations on new rules, Speaker, for financing political parties and the electoral process, uh, new rules for governing third-party advertising in elections as well. Will this Premier actually support a process that will be truly transparent, independent, and nonpartisan. Mr. Speaker, I very much look forward to the conversation this afternoon. As I already said to the uh, the leader of the opposition, I look forward to uh, meeting with both leaders, Mr. Speaker. We are going to be bringing legislation forward in the spring. We are going to propose that we have an extended period of uh, of consultation, Mr. Speaker. That uh, the standing committee that uh, that is working on that piece of legislation travel the province, and there be uh, adequate and ample opportunity for people in this province to have input so we get that legislation right. But, Mr. Speaker, I think there is a high degree of agreement that we need to move forward. We need to catch up with other jurisdictions that have uh, have already changed the rules, Mr. Speaker. I said last June that we needed to do this. I look forward to moving uh, moving ahead with this, and I look forward to the conversation this afternoon with the leaders. Thank you. Supplementary. Well, Speaker, when Premier Bill Davis was faced with reforming how Ontario funded elections back in 1970, he asked a tripartisan commission to make recommendations because he said he wanted to create, quote, an atmosphere above and beyond public doubt, suspicion, or cynicism, end quote. But this Premier appears to want to have all the power to make these decisions in her office. Why is she push pushing to create a system that's open to doubt, suspicion, and cynicism? Cynicism, Speaker. Thank you. Thank you. Well, Mr. Speaker, quite to the contrary, uh, the reason I've asked the leaders of the opposition to come in to have a meeting with me to talk with them, and I understand that they uh, they're very interested in this subject, and they have uh, they have input that they can bring from uh, from their benches and beyond, Mr. Speaker, and that we then have a very full discussion of that legislation in the public realm. That's what I will be proposing this afternoon. And there are some specific issues in terms of transition into uh, the uh, the ban on corporate and union donations, some of the timing, and what 
we should how we should manage those. I'm looking forward to hearing their input when we meet this afternoon, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. Speaker, when new financing rules were passed in Ontario in 1975, an Election Finances Commission was created. It had representatives nominated by political parties, nonpartisan ventures from the Law Society of Upper Canada, the chief electoral officer, and a chair put forward by the Lieutenant Governor of the province. Speaker. It created a system that was stable for almost 25 years. Then, in 1998, an order to eliminate a nonpartisan expert commission came right from the office of Premier Mike Harris. The Premier has acknowledged that she already is writing the new rules without any consultation. Why is she following the example of Mike Harris, Speaker? Thank you. Mr. Speaker, <clears throat> I am very interested in an open process. I'm very interested in moving ahead. But, Mr. Speaker, I believe that there is a fair degree of consensus in terms of the direction that we need to move. I also believe that to add process, to layer process on top of process, to delay yeah. the final decisions does not make NDP sense, Mr. Delay. Speaker. I think NDP we need to move to make the decisions that have been Why discussed in public for some time that other jurisdictions have already adopted, Mr. Speaker. We need to take those steps to move expeditiously. I look forward to our meeting this afternoon so we can get started. Thank you. New question. For Mr. 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 My next question is also for the Premier. Thank you very much. When, when Mike Harris decided to get rid of this nonpartisan system by fiat from the Premier's office, the current member for St. Catharines called it an anti-democratic strategy hatched in the back rooms of the Premier's office. End quote. John Gerritsen, the former Liberal member for Kingston in the Island, said, quote, What's happening here is that the governing party that happens to be in power at any one time is going to have a distinct advantage above the normal advantages of incumbency, end quote. Former Liberal Premier Dalton McGuinty said, quote, There are simple rules of fairness. You can't change the rules of the games without the consent of all players involved, end quote. So why is this, Premier Speaker, hatching plans in the back rooms of the Premier's office instead of through a non-partisan process that gets Ontarians to buy in? Well, Mr. Speaker, I would say to the leader of the third party, why is she not talking about the substance of the changes that need to happen? Why is she not putting forward ideas about how she thinks the system needs to change, Mr. Speaker? Because that actually is the issue. Instead of talking about how we can have more process that will actually delay the final decision, Mr. Speaker, why is the leader of the third party not putting forward her ideas on what the transition should be between uh, the current system and the changes and banning corporate union donations, Mr. Speaker? Why is the leader of the third party not talking about uh, third party advertising? Why is she not talking about the kinds of changes that she would like to see? Those are the subjects that I'm looking forward to having a conversation about this afternoon. Speaker, the Toronto Star weighed in at the time as well. They said, quote, the rules governing elections have been changed only when there has been a consensus among the three parties in the legislature. McLean's wrote, quote, for 25 years, election financing bills in Ontario have been tabled with all party consensus, but Ontario Premier Mike Harris tossed aside that tradition, end quote. And Richard Brennan, who at that time was working for my own Hamilton Spectator speaker, wrote, quote, the government broke tradition yesterday by tabling proposed legislation affecting the Election Finances Act without fir first getting all party consent. Why does this Premier believe that she alone should be writing the rules, Speaker? I don't believe that, Mr. Speaker. I don't believe that for a minute. I think that there has already begun a broad public discussion. I think that there is a fair degree of consensus on where we need to go. I have heard, I have heard from certainly the Leader of the Opposition where uh, he thinks he, we need to go in terms of uh, banning corporate union donations. Mr. Speaker, I'd love to hear from the Leader of the Third Party the substance of her ideas. I look forward to that conversation this afternoon, Mr. Speaker, where perhaps we will be able to talk about the direction that we should go so we can build some consensus among ourselves and we can then begin that public discussion as a result of the introduction of legislation into which there has been input from all sides of the House. Speaker, it is definitely time to take big money out of politics. It's time to get rid of corporate and union donations. But this Premier is actually choosing a partisan route that was begun by Mike Harris instead of our proud history of consensus. Speaker, Can this Premier explain why she's tossing out decades of tradition and deciding that decisions should be made in the back rooms of the Premier's office? Sure. 
Mr. Speaker, you know, what I, what I am doing is I am responding to a moment in time where there are other jurisdictions that have moved in a particular direction, have made changes, Mr. Speaker, that I believe we need to make. We are updating a system that has grown out of date, Mr. Speaker. I said a year ago in June that uh, we needed to make changes. I am looking for input from all sides of the House. There's been a public discussion, discussion in the last number of weeks that has been precipitated by the media, and is an, it's a welcome and important discussion, Mr. Speaker. So I look forward to hearing from the leaders of the opposition. I look forward to the public discussion that will ensue once we bring legislation to the House, Mr. Speaker, and it then goes to committee. And across the province, people can have input into how they think that legislation should change Answer. the rules under which we all operate, yes. Mr. Speaker. In question, the member from Prince Edward Hastings. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. My question this morning is for the Premier. Speaker, on Friday, an environmental review tribunal granted a stay of construction for the White Pines wind turbine project in Prince Edward County, an unwilling host community. Under the terms of the contract, this project has to be finished, its construction, and attached to the grid by mid-June of this year. If it isn't, WPD has defaulted on the terms of their contract, and the taxpayers can get out of it without a cost. That is, unless they get an extension that only the Minister of Energy can give them. So, Speaker, my question is, will the minister be granting an extension to WPD, or will they have to be operational by June? Thank you. Minister of Environment and Climate Change. Minister of the Environment and Climate Change. Mr. Speaker, this is before the Environmental Review Tribunal right now. They have not made a ruling yet. Uh, they have issued a statement that they will be consulting with both parties to look at the consequences. Uh, we, we operate the ERT on the weight of convenience, Mr. Speaker, uh, which means that they look at harm at, at both outcomes in making their decisions. As there can be an appeal to me and to this government, it's very important that we, as the House, protect the integrity of that process and not politicize it. So I would suggest that we allow the ERT process to proceed as an independent process, and at the right and appropriate point when, ap when appeals can happen from the ERT, but I don't think we should be commenting on this House until that process is completed. Thank you. Supplementary. Mr. Speaker, uh, back to the Premier. The people of Prince Edward County are watching this government's every move. The IESO can uphold the current terms of the contract, but if WPD wants an extension, they can only get it from the Minister of Energy. They've also, WPD, contributed $15,000 to the Ontario Liberal Party. I guess we know where this is going. Most of it since the environmental review process began. Oh. Mm. Speaker, my question to the Premier is simple. Will she require that the IESO enforce the current terms of the contract, which would put WPD in default if they aren't connected by mid-June, or has WPD already bought themselves an extension? Good question. Um, this is the moment in which I've uh, alerted all members uh, that I will be listening carefully to this, and I'm going to ask the member uh, to very, uh, if the theme is there, to be very cautious of how he impugns any motive. Uh, and you will need to do some homework on that to ensure that it's not happening. Minister. Thanks, thanks, Mr. Speaker. I want to recognize that there are people here in the gallery from the Prince Edward Hastings Local Business and Tourism Board, and I, I, I want to uh, recognize the efforts that they are taking and to work through a democratic process, Mr. Speaker. Uh, on that process, Mr. Speaker, but I also want to deal with the last point the member made. Sir. You're not endearing yourself by uh, repeating what I asked not to be repeated. <laughs> Carry on. I, I want to make one point here, Mr. Speaker. Through this process, our job, mine and the, 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 the member for Hastings Prince Edward County, is to protect the integrity of this process. And I'm very clear and have no difficulty doing that. And I find it deeply, deeply offensive that someone would suggest in a process in which politicians are not allowed to interfere in, he That's is right. actually yeah, suggesting yeah. I interfere in that process, Mr. Speaker. The member from Prince Edward Hastings will come to order. Uh, you have one sentence wrap-up, please. 
So shame on him, Mr. Speaker, because it sounds like the pot is calling the kettle black here. Shame on him. The question, the member from Kitchener, Waterloo. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Premier. For 25 years, it was the practice to have consensus among Ontario's political parties before changing the rules about election campaigns. Bill Davis established a multi-partisan election finances committee in 1975 that included the chief electoral officer and non-partisan members of the legal community to ensure that there was fairness. David Peterson changed the rules, but only after extensive discussions with the other leaders and the same elections commission. But when Mike Harris changed the rules, it came straight from the Premier's office. Is this uh, Premier going to be following in the footsteps of Bill Davis and David Peterson, or will she keep all of the decision-making power in the Premier's office, just like Mike Harris? <laughs> Mr. Speaker, I think the only person who would be more agitated about me being compared to Mike Harris is Mike Harris, because quite <laughs> frankly, Mr. Speaker, we didn't see eye to eye on anything. Mr. Speaker, including on this, I think it's very important that there be a public process. I think it's very important that we look for the consensus among all sides of uh, along the, the political continuum, Mr. Speaker. And I think that moving to where other jurisdictions, including the, the federal government, Mr. Speaker, a process that began under a Liberal government and continued under uh, the Conservative government, that we that we move to that consensus position that other jurisdictions have taken, Mr. Speaker. I look forward to the conversation with the leaders of the office. I have said that we will be introducing legislation that has many of the components uh, that other jurisdictions have already adopted, Mr. Speaker. But I look forward to the uh, the conversation with the leaders of That's the right. opposition parties because there may be some uh, there may be some issues in terms of transition and so on that uh, that they would like to share with me. Thank you. Supplementary. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. I, I think it's important for the Premier to understand that Ontarians and the most of the people in this House don't think that you're going to get this right on fundraising. Ontario's New Democrats want to see a process that ensures that the new rules are developed through an independent and transparent Order. and nonpartisan process, and once passed into law, have the broad support of Ontarians required to ensure their legit legitimacy and the respect. Will the Premier commit to taking this process out of her back rooms and make this nonpartisan and transparent process led by consensus among Ontario's political parties? Thank you. Speaker, I think what the third party is asking for is more process that will delay the decision, Mr. Speaker. That is not what we are going to do. What we are going to do is we are going to put in place a process whereby there will be broad input from people across the province, Mr. Speaker. There will be broad public discussion. We will extend the hearings, Mr. Speaker, and make sure that there is a longer period for that consultation. In the interim, Mr. Speaker, the input that I'm looking for from the leaders of the opposition parties. Yes, I'm having a meeting today. I look forward to that. But, Mr. Speaker, as we draft the legislation, if there is input that they would like to give us, we look forward to that, and then we will be able to get on with that broad public discussion that I think is necessary, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. Your question, the member from Davenport. My question is to the Minister of Training, Colleges and Universities. Minister, the young people in my riding of Davenport often find trouble navigating the barriers to getting involved in the process of finding a job. I often hear that they lack the direction and guidance they need to make informed decisions and find good jobs that will contribute to their growth as a professional. This is especially the case for young people who face multiple barriers to employment, resulting from some combination of complex, challenging life circumstances. Minister, Minister, I understand that you recently announced the launch of a new summer program aimed at helping young people overcome challenges and barriers to finding suitable, meaningful employment. Can you please inform the members of the House on how this new program will help our most vulnerable youth access the necessary training and employment services to find meaningful jobs? Thank you, Minister of Training College Universities. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I want to thank the member from Davenport for that very good question, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, earlier th last week, my ministry was pleased to launch a summer component of Ontario's Youth Job Connection program. The Youth Job Connection is a key component of our government's youth job strategy. I am proud to say that, Mr. Speaker, through this strategy, our government is investing an additional $250 million over two years to help roughly 27,000 of Ontario's students to find part-time and full-time jobs. 
The Youth Job Connection Summer Program will provide part-time and after-school job opportunities to high school students aged 15 to 18 who face challenging, in life, challenging life circumstances and may need support transitioning between school and work. Mr. Speaker, and this is one of the two new programs we yes, announced sir. last week. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thank you to the Minister for the answer. Minister, when youth face barriers to opportunity based on background or circumstance, it is the responsibility of this government to make sure that they have access to the training they need to help them grow their skills and join the workforce. It is reassuring to the young people in my riding that the summer component of Youth Job Connections is now in place to help them gain access to the labour market. I understand this program is part of our government's commitment to strengthening Ontario's youth job strategy, which will help support a comprehensive suite of new youth employment programs. Many constituents in my riding of Davenport would be happy to know more about another program that launched last week to help young people with fewer barriers access services that are available year-round. Minister, could you inform myself and the members of the House Question. on Youth Job Link, another new program that is now in place to support young people across Across our province. Thank you, Minister. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And again, I want to thank the member for that question. Mr. Speaker, helping youth of all abilities and the backgrounds access the most effective employment and training is part of our government's economic plan to grow the economy and create jobs in this province. With that goal in mind, Mr. Speaker, last week Ontario also launched a youth job, youth job link which is helping young people aged 15 to 29 plan their careers, prepare for the labour market and connect to job opportunities. The Youth Job Link program will be available year-round to youth and students at more than 320 locations across our province. It will offer information on career options, help with resume writing, preparing for interviews and assistance to match their skills with employers' needs. Mr. Speaker, with Youth Job Connection Summer Component as well as Youth Job Link program in place, Ontario has the right combination of yes, programs sir. in place to help youth with the broad spectrum of backgrounds, abilities, and the needs to get training they need to actively participate Thank in you. our economy. Question: The member from Leeds, Glenbrook. Thanks, Speaker. My, uh, my question is to the Premier. The Sudbury by-election allowed the Liberal Party to raise. $2.2 million. That's just shy of the $2.6 million they raised in the last general election. Some may ask, how could they do that? Mm -hmm. Well, they had prolific Liberal bagman Jerry Lawhe Jr. up there in Sudbury, a man notorious for making promises in exchange for favours, yep. a man who is under uh, investigation and facing corruption charges. Mr. Speaker, how many promises did Jerry Lawhe Jr. make? in exchange for donations to the Liberal Party. Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Interesting. Interesting. My, I have a favourite bibli biblical quotation for the member, and it comes from the New Testament, John 8, verse 7, and I'll paraphrase. Let he who is without sin cast the first stone. If you and your leader were so interested in reforming fundraising in this province, you'd be wondering about that $5,000 a person dinner at Barbarians and whether you're going to cancel it, or that $10,000 a person dinner at the Albany Club with an exclusive 10 in the province, or your leader's dinner donors are encouraged to pay $25,000 for a victory table. 10,000 more than a normal table for an opportunity Answer. to host a caucus member. You are living, sir, your party, so I say through the leader, in a glass house. I advise you. you not to throw stones. Thank you. Start the clock. Supplementary. I'm not sure, uh, Speaker, if that was an admission of guilt with that dodge and I deflection from the government. I'm sure that the member opposite will agree with me. 
We know Jerry Lahey Jr. can fundraise. Yep, he yep. once raised $115,000 in a single night for Justin Trudeau at a swank $1,300 a plate dinner. Uh, um, easy. Finish, please. But Jerry Lai Jr. is uh, facing corruption charges. He alleged, promised a job to Andrew Olivier in exchange for stepping down. How do we know, Speaker, that he didn't make promises yep. as part of those donations in the Liberal by-election in Sudbury? But you know what? The, the member opposite likes to make a number of quotes. I'll, I'll make a quote today. I think the uh, the best indicator Question. of future behaviour is past behaviour. That's why we on this side of the House are asking for an inquiry. Mr. Speaker, does the Premier have anything to hide Thank you. with the millions of dollars raised in Sudbury? Thank you. Deputy House Leader. Well, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. I, I think if the member would go through the list of donations, he would find out that none other than the Progressive Conservative Party has received donations from Jerry Lahey. Oh! So I ask the question, did that have any, did, did that have any influence on, on anything that is done by the Conservative Party? I always wonder, Mr. Speaker, when I read about a fundraiser such as the $10,000 a person fundraiser at the Albany Club, I watch carefully the next day or the next House sitting to Order. see what questions are asked in the House, because one might draw the conclusion when one sees who's at that dinner and then listens to the questions in the House or the stance taken by the opposition. The member from Leeds, Grenville, second time. The member from Leeds Grenville is warned. Next comment. Wrap up, please. So one always wonders when uh, there's a fundraiser and the questions come in the house and the stance is taken whether that people at that fundraiser had any influence on Conservative Party policy. Thank you. Any question? The member from London, Fanshawe. Speaker, my question is to the Premier. Hospitals in London are grappling with another year of deep cuts under this Liberal government. In the past two weeks, we've learned that St. Joseph's and London Health Sciences are both cutting the equivalent of 60 full-time positions. Budgets for supplies are being cut, and 12 crucial transitional care beds will be shut down this October. People in my community want to know. Why is this Premier forcing hospitals in London to cut patient care, lay off frontline staff, and shut down even more beds? Thank you. Well, Mr. Speaker, uh, I know that the, uh, the member opposite, when she is in conversation with constituents, will remind the, uh, the constituents that the, uh, the budget actually puts uh, a billion more dollars into health care in this province, Mr. Speaker, including $345 million for hospital funding. And, Mr. Speaker, you know, in terms, of, in terms of the number of nurses in this province, Mr. Speaker, in terms of the numbers of doctors, there have been thousands more nurses and doctors in this province in our term of government 26,300 more nurses mr speaker in this uh, in this uh, uh, in this province as a result of our policies so mr speaker we will continue to support the health care system we will continue to work with uh, with individual health care systems and hospitals around the province including in london mr yes, speaker sir. including in london and make sure that people get the health care that they need in a timely manner mr speaker Thank you. Speaker, when I'm speaking to constituents, uh, they're reminding me about the health care policies that this Liberal government is causing to fail the, the services of health care. Again, to the Premier, hospitals in London have, been re have revealed just how deep this Liberal government is cutting health care. St. Joseph's has seen effectively a $36.5 million cut to its total budget over the past four years. London Health Sciences says that 2016 17 marks the fifth straight year that funding will not keep up with rising costs. And we all know who pays the price for these cuts. It's patients who wait longer for care they need. It's families who are forced to deal with more worry and more stress. 
and it's the frontline health care workers, Speaker, that don't deserve a pink slip Question. from this government. How can this Premier once again slash funding to hospitals in London and expect patient health care not to suffer? Thank you. Thank you recognized in this budget that there was a need to increase funding to hospitals. That's why, Mr. Speaker, there's a $345 million increase to hospitals in the province. I had talked, I had talked with CEOs of hospitals, Mr. Speaker. The Minister of Health and Long-Term Care had talked with, health, uh, with hospital CEOs. We understood that there needed to be an increase. That's why there's a billion more dollars in health care overall and $345 million for hospitals, Mr. Speaker. You know, St. Joseph's Health Care, um, that's the, the Hamilton St. Joseph's Health Care uh, System, Mr. Speaker, received uh, $395 million. Uh, Dollars, Mr. Speaker, in 2015-16 for base in base funding, and that's a 48% increase since 2003, Mr. Speaker. So over that period of time, 48% increase, Mr. Speaker, and that's just one hospital, Mr. Speaker, across Answer. the province. There have been increases, and this year, 345 million dollars in this year's budget. Thank you. Your question, the from Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Municipal Affairs and Housing. Uh, good after each municipal election cycle, it's regular practice for the ministry to conduct a review of the rules governing municipal elections. And last week in the House, the minister introduced proposed changes via Bill 181, the Municipal Elections Modernization Act. Mr. Speaker, we're all aware that our local communities are critical hubs of democratic activity and an important entry point into Ontario's governance system. That's why our municipalities and local leaders need to be supported by strong, clear, and modern rules. Mr. Speaker, these are important goals. Through you, can the minister explain how these goals are going to be reflected in this bill? Thank you. Well, Minister of Municipal Affairs and Housing. Mr. Speaker, I want to thank the honourable member for his question, and I'll do certainly the best I can to answer it. Uh, after each, he's correct. After each election, we do do a consultation. And uh, this time around, we had 3,400 submissions uh, from councils, citizens, staff, uh, municipalities. And based in turn on that, uh, we look closely at changes uh, to uh, campaign finance rules, regulating third-party advertising, challenges and barriers to making elections accessible, increasing, of course, transparency and accountability, and allowing more local choice, the length of the campaign period, and whether municipal election rules are effectively enforced. Mr. Speaker, if this bill uh, should be fortunate enough to be passed, there will be improvements in all those areas, and I look forward to the bill moving forward. Answer. Through. Thank you. Supplementary. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. And as a former municipal councillor, I very much appreciate uh, the changes that have been proposed to make our elections more uh, effective and more transparent. But in addition to those goals, the minister has in, in, uh, put in place a new uh, objective, and that is to give our municipalities the option to have ranked ballots in the 2018 oh, municipal election. Mr. Speaker, this is a new frontier in Ontario, and this goal has garnered a lot of attention throughout the province. And our municipal partners have been asking us whether we could uh, move forward with these efforts uh, for 2018 for their communities. Mr. Speaker, can the minister share what, his, what he and his team have been hearing and working on with respect to ranked ballots? Thank you. Minister? Yes, uh, Mr. Speaker, I could do that. The uh, majority of feedback we received during our consultation, in fact, had to do with ranked uh, ballots, which is why we propose to make that an option for our municipal, municipal partners. Uh, the sense was in the letters that we received that with voter turnout going down and, and seemingly less interest in municipal elections, that we needed a way to help engage more voters in the process and also one that would enhance the process itself by having it be more substantive and uh, in terms of debate and what have you. So uh, we think uh, we've uh, done that in a number of ways, ranked ballots being one. Of course, it will be optional, and uh, our hope is it would get us away from some of the negative campaigning that so often happens in political arenas. So we look forward to work, continuing to work with communities. They deserve the best possible municipal leadership, and we think the changes in Bill 181 will help assure that. Thank you. New question. The member from Richie Oslo. Uh, thank you, Speaker. My question is for the Premier. 
A year ago, the Minister of Health was asked by Christine Elliott to expand post-stroke recovery services for those individuals between the ages of 20 through 64. She referenced the circumstances of a local Durham resident, Jim McEwen, who's championed changes to the legislation. Speaker, unless covered by private insurance, post-stroke survivors cannot receive the essential rehabilitation services that are needed for recovery. The minister responded at that time, Speaker, my ministry for some time has been working on the precise issue that she has raised. Mr. Speaker, one year, one year after that statement was made in this House, nothing further has been forthcoming to help post-stroke survivors. When will the Premier and her Question. government start to satisfy not only the expectation of Ontario residents, but its actual commitments? Associate Minister of Health and Long-Term Care. Associate Minister of Health and Long-Term Care. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I thank the member opposite for the question and his ongoing advocacy. And I just want to say, as we all know, Minister Hoskins is absolutely committed to putting patients first and making sure Ontarians get the health care they deserve. And that's why, Mr. Speaker, in this budget, we've increased base funding for Ontario's hospitals by $345 million, including a 1% increase to base funding. This is an investment that will keep not only hospitals uh, open across our system, but also ensure that Ontario get the care they deserve. But Mr. Speaker, you know, we are making investments across the healthcare sector. And let me just give you an example. On Friday, I was up in Cochrane only to announce the redevelopment of 69 new beds, Mr. Speaker. These are the examples of the investments we continue to make in healthcare. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Answer. Supplementary. Speaker, again to the Premier. Will the Premier now admit that she's been unable to implement this essential reform because of the inability of her government to adequately manage the health care system. Speaker, is this not simply further evidence of the systemic problems inherent with a government mired in its own scandal, waste and mismanagement? Or do post-stroke survivors have to attend $6,000 Liberal dinners to get their voices heard? Thank you. <coughs> Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I just want to talk a little bit, Mr. Speaker, about some of the rehab services that we have been investing in. For example, Mr. Speaker, with, with our changes, we've doubled the number of publicly funded physiotherapy clinics in Ontario. In total, 200,000 additional seniors will have improved access to high-quality physiotherapy. By the end of 2014, CCAC has provided in-home services to an additional 35,000 clients. Mr. Speaker, we have set no limits on physiotherapy sessions to ensure that Ontarians get the rehab, the services that they need, Mr. Speaker. And I can assure this House that the minister, when he is back, will uh, be able to speak at length about some of the investments we continue to make, Mr. Speaker. I can assure this House that our minister and our premier are committed to ensure that Ontarians get the services they need and deserve at the right time. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. New question, the leader of the third party. Thank you, Speaker. My question is for the Premier. Supervi supervised access sites are a way for families going through often adversarial family matters where children are involved to have a neutral and, as uh, the name suggests, supervised visit between non-custodial non parent and their children. In Hamilton, supervised access has been provided professionally and compassionately for years by the downtown YWCA, but the Y has not received an increase in base funding for eight straight years and has now had to cut back on the hours, the days, the access speaker that struggling families desperately need. It is so bad that the Y has been forced to remove five families now from the wait list that already stretches into years. Will the, sorry, does the Premier think it's okay that her government is preventing children from seeing their parents, Speaker? Their children you, Premier. Services. Minister of Children and Youth Services. Thank you, Speaker. And I want to thank the member of the third party for her question. Of course, it's always the intent on the government side to keep families intact wherever possible, to keep families uh, with their children where possible, where they can be safe and secure and healthy. And if that's not the case, uh, Speaker, we want to make sure that uh, all of our partners in the sector who are mandated to look after children achieve that objective, whether it's a children's aid society, a partner agency. And uh, I'd be very happy to talk to the leader of the third party about the specifics of this case, recognizing I can't comment on 
uh, individual children or their family situation, but our goal remains the same. We are resolute in ensuring that children receive uh, their supports and the services that they need to be protected and to reach their full potential. Thank you. Thank you. Supplementary. Well, with all due respect to the Minister, Speaker, that's exactly the opposite of what's happening here in Hamilton. Supervised access isn't even a choice for struggling family speaker. It is a court-ordered process. It's court-ordered. Supervised access centres place the focus on children. As one Hamilton mother actually described it to me, the supervised access site at the Y helps, quote, keep families together in a healthy way, which leads to well-adjusted children turning into well-adjusted adults, end quote. So what does the Premier and her minister say to this mother and to all families who are desperate for supervised access for the sake of their families? but who can't get it because the government refuses to adequately fund it, Speaker. Thank you. Minister. Thanks again, Speaker. And, uh I'm open to uh, you know, the device of the third party. Obviously, we do uh, respect and uphold court orders when it comes to the care and protection of, of children in our province, and I'm, I'll be pleased to speak to her as well as uh, my colleague ministries who provide funding for uh, local community groups. And, uh, at the end of the day, Speaker, uh, it is about what's best for our children. It's about what's best to help them reach their full potential. Of course, we'll adhere to, we want to recognize and respect the court orders. And uh, at the end of the day, Speaker, um, each situation often has its own circumstances. So as I said, I'd be happy to hear from the, uh, the leader of a third party or my critic uh, about the case in general, and then we can respond perhaps more specifically Answer. to her. Thank you. Thank you. Your question, the member from Kingston in the audience. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Aboriginal Affairs. The Minister has recently announced a number of investments targeted towards driving economic development and creating jobs in Indigenous communities. Just last month, I had the opportunity to announce funding for two programs in my riding of Kingston and the Islands that provide support for Aboriginal students. St. Lawrence Project, College's Project Kickstart College and the Self-Identification Project at Queen's University developed and run by Four Directions in the Aboriginal uh, Student Centre. These investments reflect the government's commitment to work with Indigenous partners and Indigenous youth to create a better future for everyone in the province. Can the minister please elaborate on the steps our government is taking to create economic opportunities for Indigenous Question. communities in Ontario? Thank you. Minister of Aboriginal Affairs. Thank you. Speaker, the Ontario government wants to ensure Indigenous peoples have the opportunity to succeed and fully participate in the economy. Our government is moving forward on many fronts by creating initiatives that are supporting business growth and providing economic development opportunities, jobs and skill sets for Aboriginal peoples. That's why we're doing the following four things. $322,000 for the Timmins Native Friendship Centre through the Aboriginal Community Grants Program, $175,000 to support a new welcome centre in Aquasasne, $200,000 for Ms. Wiebeck to develop employment and training opportunities for Indigenous peoples here in Toronto, $481,000 for Gagiga Mikam Aboriginal Employment and Training Centre to attract, hire, train and retain Indigenous apprenticeships in skilled trades. This is good for Aboriginal economic development. It's good for Ontario's Thank economic you. development. Hey, hey. Very good. Mr. Speaker, it's clear that our government is committed to working with Indigenous partners to create good jobs and economic opportunities in Indigenous communities, because we all recognize that creating economic opportunities for Indigenous peoples strengthens Ontario's economy. When Indigenous people prosper, all of Ontario prospers. I understand that these recent announcements are part of larger initiatives to promote economic development opportunities for Indigenous peoples. Through initiatives such as the Aboriginal Economic Development Fund and Aboriginal Loan Guarantee Program, our government is creating stronger, more effective partnerships with Indigenous communities. Mr. Speaker, could the minister please tell us more about how the government is working to ensure that Indigenous people have the opportunity to succeed and fully participate Question. in the economy through the AEDF? Thank you. Minister. Mr. Speaker, our government introduced the Aboriginal Economic Development Fund in 2014 in the budget. 
It was to help Aboriginal businesses, communities and organizations create, diversify and collaborate in their economic development. So, as a result, to date, Ontario has funded 44 projects with Indigenous partners through this fund. Partnerships like these reflect the government's commitment to work with Indigenous partners to create a better future for everyone in the province. That is why our government launched the, the Aboriginal Economic Development Fund to create these initiatives that support economic growth, provide opportunities for jobs and skills for Aboriginal people. Speaker, supporting economic development for Indigenous communities through this fund is just one of the many, many steps on Ontario's journey of healing and reconciliation with Indigenous peoples. Thank you. New question, the member from Thank you very much, Speaker. My question is to the Minister of Transportation. Last month, the minister met with me and a delegation from Renfrew County to go over the frequently talked about continued twinning of Highway 17. While the project will reach Shield Drive this year, the next phase has yet to make it into the ministry's five-year plan. The minister knows this project is vital to the econ economy of Renfrew County as a transportation corridor. It connects Canadian nuclear laboratories and Garrison Petawawa to the nation's capital and is a major artery for commercial truck traffic. Given how crucially important this roadway is, will the minister commit to putting the fur further twinning of Highway 17 into his ministry's five-year plan? Thank you. Mr. Transportation. Uh, thanks very much, uh, Speaker. I want to thank the member from uh, Renfrew, Nipissing, Pembroke, for not only for his question, Speaker, uh, but also for his advocacy on this issue. I, he was. Uh, he was good enough to join. <laughs> Speaker, he was good enough to join uh, the municipal representatives that I had the pleasure of meeting with from his community. We had a fantastic conversation. The ministry, both the ministry and myself, Speaker, recognize the importance of this particular highway project and the impact uh, potentially that it will have, or the impact that it will have as we continue to four-lane through the county of Renfrew. Speaker, I can assure that member that I will continue to work closely with his community, and the ministry understands the importance of this. Uh, this particular artery, artery in eastern Ontario, and we'll continue to have conversations as we go forward. This, the member should also know, I believe he does, Speaker, that the environmental assessments for the next phases are being completed, and the ministry Answer. will continue to work with his community on this project. Supplementary. Thank you, Speaker. I say to the minister, we appreciate the work that has been done up till now, but we cannot stop. The minister's predecessors asked the county, uh, the county government to make the case for the continued twinning of 17, and I believe they have made that case over and over again in spades. It's now up to the minister. He would also know that the federal government has made favourable overtures regarding infrastructure investments. Given that this is a trans-Canada highway, I would ask that the minister take advantage of the federal infrastructure commitment and place the highest priority on this project. Four-laning will be a boom to Renfrew County, both economically and socially, as well as making the route safer for everyone who travels it. Speaker, I'll ask the minister again if he will commit to putting the next phase of twinning Highway 17 into his ministry's five-year capital infrastructure plan. Thank you. Thank you. Minister. Uh, thanks, uh, thanks very much, Speaker. I thank the member opposite for his follow-up question. I also want to thank him, Speaker, for acknowledging that we now have a federal government in Ottawa that understands the importance of investing in crucial infrastructure. Speaker, I, I believe that member also knows that in this year, in 2015-2016, the Ontario Liberal government has committed more than $2.4 billion to expand and rehabilitate roads, bridges, highways right across the province of Ontario. Budget 2016 included, Speaker, a number of these crucial projects. And not that many days ago, I joined with a number of my colleagues. We were down in the community of Puslinch, where we announced, of course, funding support in that community, in, in Wellington, Speaker, for, uh, for the uh, Morriston Bypass, which I know is of crucial economic importance to that part of our province. Speaker, as I said in my initial answer, I'll continue to work with that member and with this yes, community sir. to make sure that going forward, perhaps in partnership with the new Liberal government in Ottawa, that we'll get this done. Thanks Thank very you. much, Speaker. New question, the member from Timmins, James Bay. My uh, question is to the Premier. Premier, unfortunately, you would have heard, like all Ontarians, the tragedy that is taking place in Attawapiskat as we speak. Unfortunately, this is not the first time that we've seen a rash of suicides on the James Bay. In fact, uh, about five years ago, we had a similar situation going on. Myself and Pegatano and others from the James Bay, along with then Grand Chief Stan Ludet, went to your government and asked for money for Pegatano 
in order to put in place the staff necessary to deal with this on an ongoing, long-term basis. And your government did it. I give you some credit. But two years later, you took that money away. We got over a million dollars in order to hire staff to be able to do the work that helps prevent these type of things from happening. My question to you is, if you make a commitment to do something this time, question. will you take the money out once the media has gone away? Thank you. Mr. Speaker, I'm very worried about and very concerned about what's happening in Attawapiskat and, quite frankly, in other, uh, in other remote northern communities as well. Um, the member opposite knows that I've been to Attawapiskat. I know that there are, uh, there are myriad concerns with, uh, within the community, whether it's housing, whether it's, uh, whether it's counselling and uh, support, as the member opposite has said. Um, we've assured uh, Chief Bellegarde that our government is, is convinced and is uh, committed to supporting First Nations communities in their times of and in fact, Minister Hoskins uh, will be travelling to Attawapiskat this week, Mr. Speaker. But in the interim, uh, as we speak, uh, there is assistance leaving from uh, from our government's resources to go to Attawapiskat right now. So, Mr. Speaker, we will we will do everything we can to, to put the supports in place. I know that the member opposite knows that the the concerns are multifaceted. There's not a single thing. There's not just one thing that has to be done. There are a number of concerns, and we'll Thank be you. working with the community, Mr. Speaker. I agree with you, Premier. It is a multifaceted response that's needed to a very complex issue, and there's not enough time in question period to go through it. But I think what I want to know, and I think what the people of James Bay and Attawapiskat want to know, is that there is a long-term commitment to what is a huge problem in our communities. When you have 11 people in one day, from age 11 to age 71, who try to take their life because of the situation in their community, I think people need to know that the response on the part of our provincial and federal government, because we're the ones who do social services in those communities with our child and youth services, we're the ones that run the hospitals that provide the services in those communities. So we need to have an assurance that whatever we do going forward from here is going to be an ongoing and long-term commitment, Question. and we're not going to pull it away once the cameras have moved away from the store. Thank you. Well, Mr. Speaker. I agree with the uh, with the member opposite, and apart from the you know the innuendo at the end that somehow this is about uh, the lights of the cameras, that's that's not at all what this is about, Mr. Speaker. This is about long-term sustained support that we are working to put in place across the province, working with the federal government, Mr. Speaker. The Minister of Children and Youth Services will also be going this week, Mr. Speaker, to make sure that the resources that we are sending, the resources that are in place, are adequate, where they need to be enhanced, we need to figure out how to do that, and we have to work in partnership with the First Nation and with the, uh, with the federal government. So I agree with the member opposite. I think he knows that. I think he knows that my concern, uh, and it's not, you know, it's not solely in response to the Truth and Reconciliation Commission, although that is, that is uh, a new part of the context within which we're working. So we will continue to work with the, with the umbrella organizations, with NAN, Mr. Speaker, with, uh, with the AFN, but Answer. most specifically with the communities, each of which has a particular set of concerns. And my ministers will be going this week to uh, make sure that we are sending the right resources that can be there to support in the short and the long term, Mr. Speaker. Pursuant to Standing Order 38A, the member from Prince Edward Hastings has given notice of his dissatisfaction with the answer to his question given by the Minister of Environment and Climate Change concerning the granting of an extension of WPD's wind turbine project in Prince Edward County. This matter will be debated tomorrow at 6 p.m. Also pursuant to Standing Order 38A, the member from Whitby, Oshawa, has given notice of his dissatisfaction with the answer to his question given by the Associate Minister of Health and Long-Term Care concerning post-stroke services. This matter will be debated tomorrow at 6 p.m. The Government House Leader on a point of order. Thank you, Speaker. I just want to uh, extend my warm welcome to Sprague Plato, who is the uh, board chair of Parkinson Society of Ottawa. Sprague was uh, in the House earlier, and I just wanna, I, I want to thank him for an amazing uh, community service uh, he, uh, he delivers in our great city of Ottawa. Thank you. There are no deferred votes. This House stands recess until 1 p.m. this afternoon. <laughs>